Today's topic is Mindful Economics, and I'm joined by Henry Lucen gore CEO and founder of the charity Promoting Economic Pluralism. And Henry is also editor of economics publication Mint Magazine. So welcome, Henry. Thank you, Neil. Great to be on. So last week, um, I was fortunate to be part of a uh, webinar, um, global webinar. There was uh, you know, representation from literally all around the world. So it was quite an impressive uh, lineup as well. And, and you were speaking about um, a circular economy, um, institutions and change. So I'm really interested in delving a little bit deeper into some of the topics uh, that you were talking about. Um, so for people who are not possibly quite so familiar with the concept of uh, circular economy. What's the current state of the nation for that as a concept? Well, the circular economy is one of those sort of bucket concepts that pull lots of different things, different ideas together. Uh, so recycling, renewal, repairing, um, more ecologically sound uh, production and so on into this sort of idea of looping round economy, things going round uh, uh, rather than a linear economy where stuff comes was uh, dug out of the, the ground at one end and stuffed in the ground at the other uh, and it's been very influential it's its main thing is that people like the name people engage with it and it, it inspires people i think it's an interesting one because I think there's a, obviously a, a nice kind of juxtaposition here between um, businesses who are looking to become more sustainable in the broadest sense of the word um, and um, sort of government and, and NGOs who are looking at this possibly at a more st strategic and sort of systemic level. I mean, you, you talk about um, the concept of, of conical resources. Um, I wonder if you could sort of go into a little bit of a, a sort of a detail there, because it feels that that is maybe one concept of a number of concepts that might be able to sort of bond together these two possibly disparate positions from government and, and business. I think so. Uh, Common pool resources is a brilliant idea developed by a Nobel Prize winner Eleanor Ostrom, the first woman to win the Nobel Prize in economics in 2009. And the idea is that there are some things that, um, a bit like water or uh, forests and uh, things like that, that are both have public benefits, have a sort of public element. We all need water to be there. We need forests for all the benefits that produces, but also there's a limited amount of it. And if one person takes a bit of it, uh, someone else doesn't get it. So. If we take the idea of a circular economy, um, that involves things that we buy and consume. And if one people, one person has them, another person doesn't, it creates resources, waste again. Uh, some people have it, some people don't. But it has much broader benefits in terms of being environmentally sustainable, in terms of uh, retaining ecological systems that we all need. So that's the sort of resource we're talking about. It's not quite totally a public good like the air we breathe and it's not quite a, a immediately private good and Ellen Ostrom looked at these uh, and how best to manage them and her broad conclusion was that it needs a set of rules that the range of people with an interest uh, in that common pool resource abide by and they're only going to really do that if we're part of making the rules um, and they're able to ensure everyone keeps to them. That's a, that introduces a really interesting um, concept of collaboration, doesn't it? Because um, a, a lot of, I guess, sort of government policy making that comes down uh, from on high to both consumers and to businesses is often sort of felt as though it's been created elsewhere. And it's kind of something that you have to abide by because it becomes a regulation or legislation. This feels much more inclusive. And it is, is this kind of almost like the joining together of sort of bottom up and top down where people are kind of meeting in the middle for kind of mutual benefit? It feels much more of a collaboration. I think that's right, um, because, you know, these are very complex systems and there's no way governments, you know, you know, policymakers in an office somewhere can work out exactly how they should be managed and somehow come up with a set of rules and uh, you know, to make sure everything happens correctly in some sense. And they're very dynamic systems, you know, people are continuously 
uh, inventing new products, different ways of using them, um, different systems for disposing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So to imagine that they can be somehow married centrally um, seems very naive. Whereas if actually all the people involved in it uh, get together and work out, collaborate to create systems, then it seems much more possible uh, to actually achieve a, a circular economy that has environmental benefits and is not just for the sake of it. So, but government has a role in terms of setting out a vision that we need a circular economy, we need environmental protection, and we need an inclusive approach to do it. So they can facilitate, set the direction, but then the bottom up comes to actually sorting out the detail and solving the problems and engaging um, citizens as consumers, but in their sense of a citizen and wanting environmental benefits, wanting a system that actually means they can continue surviving on earth. That's really interesting, isn't it? When you sort of think about where there might be sort of pockets of, of kind of best practice, because I guess, you know, with a concept this broad and, and far reaching, I guess one of the big challenges is kind of like, wow, where do you start? So uh, do, you, do you see any particular sectors or particular countries or particular economies where, you know, there is already very, very good progress being made? And it'd be interesting to explore why you think that is in those particular areas, because I guess, you know, at a local level, we kind of almost need to be learning from best practice. I'm not really aware of... Um that actually we've cracked it anywhere in particular, you know, in terms of the whole system. Um, I mean, one of the um, examples that are uh, held up as a great solution um, uh, is a guy working in um, the US who's going great traction, TerraCycle, in terms of recycling lots of products and cracking the uh, the puzzle of how to recycle very difficult to recycle things. But I talked to him, he, he's got about 20 plus major brands he works with. Uh, he's considered huge, really. But what he hasn't cracked is actually changing the whole system. So he's just picking up whatever products his clients produce and trying to recycle them. And actually, recycling can be very energy intensive, chemical intensive, and environmentally impactful. And the, but the still, the linear is still effectively there because they're producing the same sort of products, uh, as many as possible of them, uh, and not wanting to redesign them in terms of being more easy to recycle or anything like that. So actually creating that sort of system collaboration um, to produce different sorts of products and services uh, that from the whole, their whole life onwards uh, is, is totally circular and low minimal environmental impact is something we're still yet uh, to, uh, to achieve. And, and the government approach, uh, the, the general policy approach of extended producer responsibility, which is seen as a sort of holy grail, if they take total responsibility, they can sort it out. I don't think in most situations is either practical or the, or the best way of going about things because why should you assume that the producer can understand the whole system to, to solve it by themselves? And um, why will they actually have the influence and ability to get all the um, waste uh, managers, uh, renewers, repairers on side, etc., any more than anyone else will? Uh, so, I mean, IKEA, uh, for instance, you know, still yet to crack this um, in terms of finding people who will renew and repair uh, their furniture and IKEA, you know, is a pretty big and powerful organization. So I think in many ways our approach to date has not been the right approach. It becomes really interesting, I think, when you look at it, say, from the business perspective, because there's obviously a whole range of different challenges and things happening right now, particularly in businesses where, you know, maybe at the start of um, the whole COVID situation, um, they were obviously furloughing staff, there were sort of financial pressures, the whole kind of makeup of the organisation, you know, strategically looking to change. And now we add in this whole idea of, look, here's an opportunity, but of course then it's clouded with all of the kind of survival instincts that businesses almost have to have in lots of cases just to literally stay afloat going through this period and obviously with a, an economic downturn coming. It's really interesting to kind of explore 
whether or not this becomes a key business driver because obviously before well certainly sort of through the uh, sort of latter stages of last year and into the the early stages of 2020 it it felt like there was a big big momentum here from the business side of things because of potentially competitive advantage and it became one of the key business drivers going forward how do you see sort of things changing now with this kind of great big obviously pressure for survival there's a move to um, um, reshore or, or, or sort of shorten supply chains to increase control. That doesn't of itself, I think, lead to a circular economy, though it may help. I think what is more important, really, is where government goes in terms of the recovery phase. And there's a huge debate on that. You know, does it replay uh, the uh, you know the post 2008 uh, era of austerity uh, or does it look to actually stimulate uh, the economy um, from a sort of with a Keynesian uh, perspective and at the moment governments are saying that um, this government is saying that um, austerity is dead and uh, there's lots of discussion about uh, modern monetary theory uh, which uh, points out that actually governments create money. Uh, the tax is to take the money out of the system. Um, they can create money just like that, effectively. Uh, and, and banks, banks. I mean, the Bank of England has asserted this. The Fed, the Fed in US, has said, "Yep, that's right." And in 2008, we just did accounting entries and created trillions of money. And the taxation actually then sucks it back in. It's a monopoly situation where they provide uh, currency out and they can suck it in as much or as little as they want. And public debt is really debt to themselves. Now, if we take that seriously, then government has the potential to provide a stimulus, to provide money to recover. And then the question is, is that money going to provide public value? Because in the normal private sector, value is determined by who can afford what. Uh, you pay your money, and the, the general idea is the more you pay, the more value you create. Uh, of course, that is a highly controversial idea. It means that if you buy a diamond um, ring, uh, a very big one, and you're mega rich, you've created a huge amount of value. And if you're a, a key worker with very little income, you create very little value. But leaving that aside, in the world of governments being the active provider of demand, they need to be sure that they're creating public value. And here, I think, is the opportunity, because if there is to be collaboration around systems uh, for a circular economy, what glues that together must really be public value, i.e. creating sustainable systems. So if those collaborations can be formalized, and then can become effectively the providers of public value that government needs uh, to, be, to, to actually stimulate uh, demand so, so that we know that the money going into the system is actually delivering uh, benefits to the wider society, as well as, of course, employing people uh, in creating a, a circular economy, etc., and meeting uh, people's needs with goods and so on. So I think there's a potential conjunction uh, moving forward of a more government driven demand wanting to deliver public value and the potential for business uh, to collaborate with NGOs as well, with citizens to deliver uh, a circular economy. Yeah, and this feels then very much bringing the word stakeholder in, into the mix here. I'm thinking certainly from a business perspective, be it a uh, sort of medium size or larger size business, where obviously they're very conscious of their broader sort of mix of different stakeholders. This feels like now it's bringing a much higher level stakeholder into play here. If we're looking to sort of collaborate between business and, and government, um, it feels like certainly for the larger organisations, but maybe some more influential kind of medium size organizations they need some kind of systemic model to be able to work to and for is this where um i know you mentioned in the webinar the the fair shares systems management model is this where this sort of thing comes into play well yes 
uh, potentially. The, the big challenge businesses have is to demonstrate that they are trustworthy. Um, if you're going to collaborate with people, you've got to have a level of trust. And often supply chains are actually very much power driven. Um, the people, the biggest companies with the biggest power can determine you know, the terms of business, the length of contract uh, and so on. So there may be different situations where people feel these companies are more or less trustworthy. And of course, if they are fundamentally being driven uh, by uh, aggressive shareholders seeking to squeeze every return possible, then that constrains their ability to be trustworthy too. By committing to a fair shares uh, type organization where they actually uh, become shareholders in the collective enterprise with a common purpose, that increases their ability to be trustworthy because they've actually made legal commitments. They're also have, are only one voice in determining strategy uh, around creating a circular economy uh, with other voices of stakeholders, other stakeholders, other business businesses. And on a level playing field, effectively, in the, in, in the legal structure. So it has the potential to significantly change the dynamics, uh, to change the perceptions of, uh, of the trustworthiness of the different uh, players to underpin collaboration. Yeah, I really, really like the way you describe that, because for me, then, this doesn't become then exclusive to the larger multinationals, the big brands, you know, the, the, the big noises and the big voices in each sector. It feels then as though this is much more of an inclusive approach. So if you have a maybe even a small business um, that is actually doing really great things and, you know, feels as though it should and could be quite influential in this conversation, it feels like there's a place in this conversation kind of collaborative makeup because if they have good strategy good policy great examples of what they're doing it feels like they would be welcomed into a model like this absolutely um, it's it's a very flexible model uh, you can have different classes of shares for different types of stakeholders uh, so smaller businesses can then put forward someone to represent them effectively in the collaboration and uh, ensure that their voice is heard. So it is a much more inclusive uh, process where everyone gets a share. And th those people who will probably have most influence will be uh, about their ideas, uh, their, their sense of purpose, uh, the, the inspiration uh, they provide that drives forward the collaboration. Where would an organisation, I mean, obviously a lot of people um, sort of listening and, and watching this um, will be of this mindset, you know, they will be obviously very receptive to, to an idea like this. Where, where would you start? I mean, if, if you're kind of almost like new to the concept of circular economy and inclusion and, and kind of working in this kind of collaborative way, what is the first step of the journey? Well, I think it's to look at your own situation and see where you do have better relationships um, where start exploring and understanding more the wider network system that you're within and seeing whether you can begin to uh, develop a sort of shared purpose to create such an organization. Uh, because first, you, ne you need to have a common purpose. You need uh, a diversity of players within a system uh, to, to start to come together. And, and diversity is important from the start so that it shows other people who you may want to get to, to join later that it's not a, a sort of narrow club of players who are seeking to control, uh, but actually a diverse and wider set of people with a common purpose that is actually for the public good. It can't be seen as, a, a, as some sort of potential cartel. Uh, apart from anything, cartels are illegal, but also that will put off people. So you've got to start to reach out to potential stakeholders, maybe some of them that you wouldn't immediately uh, have relationships with. But the more we can sort of demonstrate how this might work and how collaboration uh, around the system uh, can be effective, then you start the ball rolling, you build momentum, 
you build stories, uh, you show that actually by working together, you can do a enormous amount more than you can as a single organization uh, in a very complex system, much of which you have little control over and little knowledge of. What an exciting opportunity, I think, for, for every organization that is either part of uh, the journey already, but looking to kind of awaken at this, you know, big, big opportunity um, and challenging time. So I, th I think a lot of people will be very interested in exploring this further. To get in contact um, with you, maybe look at uh, Mint Magazine as a publication and maybe subscribe to kind of, again, sort of fuel up this uh, strategic journey. How, sh how should people uh, get in touch with you? Well, uh, via our website, economicpluralism.org, uh, or themintmagazine.com. Those uh, contact details on both those websites. We are very interested in finding partners uh, to create effectively pilot projects uh, to sort of demonstrate how this might work in practice. And we're also looking for uh, sponsors uh, to help make this happen. So if you feel you're in a situation where you can see the potential to deliver or create collaborations, diverse collaborations uh, around creating a circular economy, then um, we'd be very keen to hear from you. Henry, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you very much, Neil. It's been a pleasure.